first time, I had a garden. I built myself a raised bed and I planted a garden. I'd never done it before, had no inclination to do it. My in-laws tried to plant a garden for us and I just let it go to weeds. It was horrible. I praise God for gardens. I really do. I have been blessed last year and again this year with just seeing how God takes something so tiny and puts it in the ground and something wonderful comes out that is so tasty and nutritious and good and it's right there you can just take it off and eat it and it's so wonderful I thank God for my garden this year again you know the metaphor of gardening in gardens is used throughout the Bible quite a bit I'm sure you know the language that has been used humanity was created where in the garden and we were tasked with what to tend it, to look after it. The garden is part of the Bible. It's used throughout the Bible in so many ways. The word garden itself is used 65 times in the Bible. And language such as seed, 111 times. Harvest, 63 times. Plant or planted, 142. Fruit, 230. Vine and vineyard, 287. These are commonplace in both the Old and the New Testament. Gardening is part of what God uses to teach us about his love. And we, the his people, are to be the branch of his planting, he says, and the work of his hands that we, or that he, may be glorified. From Isaiah 60. To begin with, what I've learned as I've had my great experience of two years now, having a garden, is there are certain things, this I learned last year very quickly, that I shouldn't plant. Last year I put in zucchini. I like zucchini. Everybody's talking about zucchini. One of my friends said, oh, well, you know who doesn't have friends? They're in the store buying zucchini. <laughs> so I wanted to make, I wanted to grow zucchini. I wanted to say I have friends. I really do. But you know, when you plant zucchini in a small garden, it overtakes. The leaves are big, it spreads out, and soon my carrots and my peas are being swamped by all of this zucchini. So I learned not to plant squash in my garden. And so it is in our gardens, our little gardens of life, in this big world, this big garden of this world. Some things that we see and that we like and that we enjoy and that we want to have want to be part of our life gardens we really shouldn't have. So I begin today talking about our gardens, our living gardens, and I begin with what we shouldn't plant in our living gardens. Squash. Because, you know, we need to squash indifference in our lives. Matthew 11, 16 and to 17 says, But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Now here Jesus is directing these words at the scribes and Pharisees primarily who refuse to join in in the joy of what is being played out all around them through the prophetic word of John the Baptist and the very presence of the Messiah. They who should have known better just as we who are the people of God should know better. God is good, is he not? God is great, and we, each one of us here, has been blessed and are blessed every single day. We woke up this morning. We woke up this morning and we found something to eat, some less, some more. We arrived at church clothed and healthy enough to be here. Whether we came on our own or someone was kind enough to bring us, we got to church this morning. We've been blessed with a safe, dry place to read scripture, to sing songs, to listen to wonderful music that is sung to us in special music this morning. We have peace in our land. 
We have peace in our land. We have all that we need, and we have the promises of the Bible. I ask you, what is not to be joyful about? Why should we be indifferent to the things around us that are great and wonderful? Life is wonderful. It's better, even, with God. And it does Him a disservice, I believe, when we fail to recognize the joy that is in Jesus Christ, the joy that is in this world, the joy that is in the fellowship and the family and all around us. As we go through life, we have to be interested and see what is there that is good and bring it forward. We need to squash indifference in our living gardens. We need to look around us each day and count our blessings one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. We need to do it every day. See what he has done for us. Squash the indifference in your life, in your life's garden. Squash, there are lots of varieties. So another squash that I would say you should avoid is squash grumbling. Philippians 2, 14 to 16 says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and wisted, twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding just to the word of life. You know, nobody wants a garden full of weeds and thistles and thorns. Nobody wants to be around others who, like weeds, cloud out the light or suck the nutrients from the very earth around us. Nobody wants to be around those who prick them and make them bleed with negative comments, depressing words and actions. Squash grumbling and let the light shine through your living garden. We are to be lights on a hill that draw others to God, not clouds that block out the light that God wants us to shine. Why is it when we have a beautiful day, so many need to say, oh, just wait, winter's coming. You know, you've heard it before. You may have uttered it before. Winter has its blessings. Today is the day of life that God has given. Look at what God has provided. And share the fruits of your garden of blessings with others. Stop grumbling. Stop grumbling today. For as James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against one another's brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Squash grumbling in your garden. Build up. Don't tear down. Unfortunately, squash is a pretty varied <laughs> vegetable in our living gardens as well. So I want to ask us to avoid in our living gardens squash gossip. The Bible says a surprising amount about gossip. And you know, everywhere I look and read about gossip, it's negative. Proverbs 20, 19 tells us not to associate with a gossiper. And he calls them simple babblers. In Proverbs 16 and 28, we're told a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. Instead, the wise man tells us that rather than going about slandering and revealing secrets, he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Have you been given secrets to hold? Do you know things about people that maybe aren't the greatest? Hold them. Pray for them. Don't share them. The Apostle Paul tells us to let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths but only such as is good for building up, 
as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 4, 29. Squash gossip in your living garden. Squash gossip. And watch how your life grows and bears fruit. Well, once I learned a little bit uh, this year, my garden's wonderful this year. It's way better than even last year. I learned what not to put into my garden. Now there are some things, and I'm going to use a little play on words here, to make our garden life grow. The first thing we want to do is plant lots of peas. Plant lots of peas. You've heard it before. Peas or peace I leave with you, the Lord says. My peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give to you. Let your hearts not be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. John 14, 27. Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, reassuring them that they, that they would not be alone. He was leaving them someone who would care for them, comfort them, who would tend their garden of life. One who would steer them away from the weeds and the pests who would block the interruption of light into their lives. The Holy Spirit was left for us so that we would have peace, or peas, if you would rather. And good gardeners in, in life need to call upon the Spirit regularly. We need to ask as he has told us we should ask because when we do, he will give to us. We shall receive. We need more than one row of peas, of course. I love peas. I used to be a garden raider when I was a kid. Peas were the first thing I went to. So another row of peas planted by our garden Jesus says in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In warning his disciples, he warns us that we will have tribulation in this world. It takes work to tend the garden. Like I said, experience was there. My, my father-in-law and mother-in-law worked hard on that garden. And it just was overcome in no time, it seemed to me. There are tribulations in life. Things will not always go well. Even for the believer. But Jesus reminds us that in the end, if we hold fast to our belief and trust in him, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we win because he has already won. Our adversary is already defeated and we need to have peace in our souls and belief in the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. When we do, we see a result that our garden does grow. Ellen White said in Christ's Object Lesson, page 61, through conflict, spiritual life is strengthened. Trials well-born will develop steadfastness of character and special spiritual graces. The perfect fruit of faith, meekness and love often mature amid, best amid storm clouds and darkness. There's a purpose to go out and do the weeding. We learn from it, not only that the garden grows better, but the exercise, the fresh air, all of it is good for us. We find peace even in the storm with Jesus Christ. And peas are also good for sharing. Hebrews 12, 14 states that we are to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see, peace is a gift. We receive it from God, but we can give it to others. That's the most remarkable thing. That's the lesson I've learned most about this garden of living in regard, with regards to peace, that as we receive the peace of Jesus Christ in our hearts, as our lives grow, 
as our garden of life grows with Jesus, peace can be shared to others. As peace has blossomed in my life, it has grown in my life, I can attest that my peace has given peace to others. In times and places where what I would normally do would cause disruption and hurt and problems and discontent, the peace that I have found in Jesus Christ has changed me to the point where now I can share that peace with others. I can hold people comfort people. I can give to others rather than simply try and get what I want. Peace, peas are so important in your garden. And next, seeding for lettuce is a must in any garden. I recently put another row of lettuce in and it's already sprouted up and growing. It's a lighter lettuce. It's going to be beautiful as I've just about finished my other it grows so quickly. It grows so quickly and it's so good in fresh salad and it adds color to, you know, when you put it down as a bed of, uh, on, a, on a bed, on, on a dish of rice or beans or something like that, it adds to your life. And there are very many varieties of lettuce as well. Let us be faithful. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the, lo the word of Christ. Our garden must be fed. Growth does not occur without nutrients to feed the needs of the plant. In our garden of life, we will not grow without the nutrients we receive from the Word of God. Have you ever kept track of the time you spend in the Word of God in one day? There's a challenge being thrown out here. Have you ever done it for a whole week? It's embarrassing to even think about it now, isn't it? It is for me. How much time do we really spend in the Word of God? How much time do we spend being faithful to the Lord who has given us the life that we are worshiping for? God's Word is our food. Have you gone a whole day without food recently? Or a whole week without food? Spiritual food needs to be taken in daily. It is what builds our faith. It helps us know who he is. We see the promises of God and then we see their fulfillment in our lives and our faith begins to grow. We may still look good, you know. We still might look good without spending time in the word. But we're not growing as we should. And like the fig tree in Matthew 21, we risk being cursed by God if we fail to enrich our lives enough with his word and thereby fail to produce the fruit that he wants us to produce in this life. For without faith it is impossible to please him, he says in Hebrews 11.6. Let us be faithful to God in his word. Let us also be kind. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgives you. You know, it seems, I read that scripture and it seems such a simple statement, doesn't it? As Christ forgave you, as Christ forgave me. We read it and we say yes. But stop and think. Stop and think of our own lives, of your life, if it's anything like me, and how sinful we have been in our lives. The lies that are told, the greed that is exhibited, the hate that spills out, the trust that is broken. Why? Why should he forgive me? Especially when we realize who he is. The Son of God brought himself from the perfection of heaven above, put aside the glory of his countenance and took the form of man, suffering and experiencing all of the temptation, all of the pain, all of the doubt and all of the suffering of humanity. Taking my sin upon him, cleansing me through his blood 
And yet he had the love in his heart to see me from the cross and say, forgive them. They know not what they do. As God in Christ forgave me. How kind is our God to offer that to each one of us. Let us be kind as he is kind. Let us be loving. It makes good sense that we are to love God. After all, he first loved us. Amen? I can understand loving him. I mean, he gave his life for me. But what about those who aren't as loving? Those who aren't as forgiving? Those who aren't as kind as my God and Lord Jesus Christ? What about those who hurt me? What about those who oppose me? Those who embarrass me? Those, that's the hardest part. That's the toughest one for me to deal with. When I've said or done something and someone points it out. What about those people who make a case of pointing that finger? What about our enemies? God says our living garden will only grow. It will only be bountiful if we love one another. If we love all, including our enemies. Luke 6.35 says, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he loves to... He gives love to the ungrateful and to the evil. Let us be loving. Last row of lettuce. Let us be patient. I won't ask you to put up your hands if this is a problem for you. But I know I'd have both up for me. We need to be patient. We need to not rush our lives. And we also don't need to rush God. Trust him in your garden. You know, some plants just take a little longer to germinate and send up their first shoots of life. Last year, I had a horrible crop of beets. I was looking forward to making borscht, and I had hardly anything. And they grew little tiny things at the end of the summer. This year... I've got beets popping up all over the place, and they're big. You know, sometimes in life we have to wait. We simply have to wait for God's will to be shown to us, for us to see what he wants for us, where he's leading us. We need God sometimes to put things in place, people in place. We can't rush God. We need to be patient with God. The prayers that we have list, lifted up and have not been answered will be answered. God has told you he will. We simply need to be patient and look to him and what he is giving to us in our lives and be thankful for that and worship him and we will see the results in our garden. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That is what he has in store for you, despite the difficulties you might have right now, despite the fact that your prayers haven't been answered for yourself, for your children, for your parents, whoever it is you're praying for. Let us be patient in life. And finally, if we're going to have vegetables in a garden, we need to make sure we have planted something of herbs or spices. And I ha highly recommend that you plant some thyme. You know, we can't help one another unless we have time with one another. We can't be helped by others unless we are with others. We are to be in this world, not of the world, but in the world. Not hidden away in our homes, not secure in our church and never leaving it. We are to be mingling with others as Christ mingled with others. 
And as we do, we are to shine the light that God gives us in our hearts that warms the seed and brings the fruit and the harvest. We need to make time in our life for other people. Sometimes we can be too secure, too comfortable, too happy where we are. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day dawning near. The day is dawning near. The harvest time is coming. We need to be in our communities, in our neighborhoods, with our church families. We need to be doing things with one another. Galatians 6 and verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You can't bear someone else's burdens unless you're in contact with them. You need to know what they are. You need to know someone well enough to say, Hey, how are you? Can I help? We need to spend time with one another. But we also need to spend time with God. I want to tell you today, if you are not praying, if you don't have a consistent and meaningful watering of your life's garden by the Holy Spirit through prayer, your garden will dry. The fruit will wither. And it will die. And I don't think... I think sometimes when we say that, sometimes the first reaction is, well... I, I'll never make it because I do pray in the morning or I do pray at night. That's good. That's good. You know, if all you do is give a blessing over your meal right now, that's good. That is a beginning because like a garden, prayer grows if we just stay with Jesus Christ Start to build it a little bit. If all you do is ask for a blessing of food, start in the morning, tomorrow. Start this evening before you go to bed. And then build on it. God will help you. Call to him in your prayer to help you remember to pray. Help you with what to pray. You don't have stop and pray our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Pray is all I'm saying. We need to spend time with God if our garden of life is to grow. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's how it happens. And we're told to pray without ceasing and in Psalms that he shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing like showers that water the earth. My garden needs to be watered. My life's garden needs to be watered. I need to spend time with God, we all do. Now it's getting close to harvest time. In the fields, we can see it all around us as we drive to church. In my garden, in your garden at home, it's already been harvested some and there's more to come but also harvest is coming in our garden of life. It is happening. It is happening around us. And if we as Seventh-day Adventists who know the prophecies and know what we have heard from the pulpit and what we've read, can't recognize that the harvest is soon, I don't know what more can be done. The days are getting shorter. And so is the time left before Christ comes in glory to claim his own. How is your garden growing? How is your garden growing? Do you have time with God? Time with others? Are you squashing the things in your life that God says don't be involved in that? Are you finding the peace of Jesus Christ as you read the Bible and as you come to him in prayer? Are you looking for that peace? Are you, are you interested in what is happening around you and how God is changing your life every day by what he blesses you with? 
How is your garden growing? God gives us all we need. Everything. Everything we need to plant, everything we need to work, everything we need to water and feed. And he has promised to come for the harvest. Are you preparing your living garden? How does your garden grow today? Let's turn to number 487 and sing a song about being in the garden with our Lord. Father God, we know that you walk beside us. We know that through the Holy Spirit you speak to us. Lord, my prayer today is that you give us the eyes to see, give us the ears to hear, that as you speak to us, as you walk with us, Lord, not only are we comforted by your kindness, by your love, by your grace, and by the bounty you provide. But Lord, that we take it in and feed the very soul of our lives so that the light within us begins to shine and that our lives are truly changed. Lord, please be with us in the garden today. Be with us throughout this week. And Lord, we pray you come soon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.